Good afternoon. My name is John Stone, and I'm the main developer of visual molecular dynamics. Uh, I work at University of Illinois, and we're an NIH-funded research uh, laboratory uh, that develops uh, tools for molecular modeling and uh, various types of biological simulation. So the goal of our uh, software tools are to enable scientists to simulate large biological systems to understand their structure and function. And of course, in times like today with uh, things like COVID being uh, studied in great detail, uh, you know, these are very large structures and very challenging systems. And we need to be able to run uh, simulations of virus uh, structures and the various components of the virus on large HPC systems. Uh, so our software has been used for uh, multiple decades to do these kinds of simulations in the ongoing improvements in uh, cryo-electron microscopy imaging techniques have allowed us to study ever larger systems over time. Uh, and you know the sort of state of the art today are these large viruses as an HIV capsid, uh, the COVID virus is another several times larger, uh, large photosynthetic organelles, and even uh, we're getting into the regime now where it is just beginning to become possible to simulate uh, prototypical cells, so the minimum sized, uh, you know, life forms that can exist uh, on their own, you might say. So supporting this work, I, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, how we ported our software to ARM and how we evaluated its performance. Uh, we did this work in conjunction with Oak Ridge National Laboratory using their Wombat, uh, Wombat cluster. Um, we used two different types of nodes, the uh, uh, Marvel Thunder X2 uh, ARM processors, uh, which were combined with NVIDIA Voltas. Uh, and also uh, new, uh, most recently, Oak Ridge has installed some Fujitsu A64FX nodes. And with those, we've been able to do some work with SVE vectorization for the first time. So the first application is NAMD. This is our parallel molecular dynamics software. Uh, it's used in biophysics and structural biology, and it's written in uh, Charm++ and CUDA. And so Charm++ is a parallel programming uh, runtime system developed at University of Illinois uh, by Sanjay Kalei, and that's how we do things like message passing on large scale machines. Um, our porting experience was very good. We had uh, NAMD running on various machines over the years, and it's a very portable piece of code. I think it took us about an hour and a half to compile NAMD and all of its dependencies from scratch. That was a great experience. It was very easy for us to get up and running on the ARM platform. I think we just had a few to, uh, tweaks uh, to the code to, in our build system to enable it to compile with the uh, CUDA 10.2, which was new at the time we did the port. Um, so our software is now ARM ready and uh, it gives correct results and we've compared that. Uh, sort of the ongoing work that we have to do for NAMD is to uh, begin doing multi-node benchmarks on clusters. And so that's uh, ongoing work and we hope to have new results there soon. Uh, for our initial analysis of uh, performance on ARM, we uh, compared NAMD's single node performance uh, between three different platforms. Uh, so the top line is uh, NVIDIA DGX2. This is a big uh, multi-GPU machine we have at Illinois. It's based on the uh, SXM2 form factor. These are the high power dense GPUs that are found in supercomputers. And we report the results in terms of nanoseconds per day. That's the uh, amount of simulation time that a scientist gets if they run the software uh, for a particular molecular structure for a whole day. So we ran this on a 99,000 atom structure uh, called uh, apolipoprotein. And so that's our, our benchmark metric to compare against. This is the most highly optimized version of the software. We ran the same test on an IBM AC922. That's a Power9 machine, uh, basically one of the summit nodes and running with the same type of GPU, but it's worth noting that on this platform, the host and the GPUs are attached through NVLink rather than PCI Express. And so that uh, platform did roughly the same result. It doesn't benefit as much from uh, CPU side vectorization, so that's worth noting. And then we have the new ARM result. Now it's uh, noteworthy here that because we had to use a PCI based uh, host machine rather than one of the HPC specific form factors, this used a regular run of the mill PCI card. They run at a very slightly lower clock rate. So there's about a 10, 15% difference in performance of the hardware. So it's not quite apples to apples, but you can see we get very nearly the same performance 
on the ARM test box that we do on the other two. So this is a very satisfying result. Um, this is great, uh, great outcome. This is again, a single node run on just a single GPU, but basically uh, what I would conclude with here is that there were no surprises. It was straightforward work. And we expect that ongoing work to optimize NAMD for ARM will uh, close remaining gaps. And I hope we can do uh, more of an apples to apples to com comparison when we have uh, other hardware available to us for testing. So I work on uh, VMD primarily, which is our visualization and analysis software. It's used to prepare, uh, visualize and analyze all the molecular simulations. And it's sort of the go between uh, for scientists between experimental structure information and the simulations that we run on the supercomputers. So it's uh, responsible for helping them build and analyze all these uh, simulations. So VMD, because it's uh, visualization heavy, it uses a lot of uh, libraries to do things like hardware accelerated ray tracing. So there uh, we did some work with early pre-release versions of libraries. So it took me, I think more like a day to do my port, but I had uh, these dependencies to work out and I had to ask NVIDIA for some help to get access to early versions of these things. I just did single node tests. Uh, but I'll show you some of our early results. Uh, my summary would be, again, we're quite happy. The ARM performance is comparable to what we get on uh, x86 and Power9. And the real uh, area where I need to do uh, additional work is just in making uh, better exploitation of ARM vectorization to speed up some of the things that we don't put on the GPUs. They're sort of the uh, molecular pre-processing pre-processing that gets done before data is uh, sent to the GPUs for the dense uh, number crunching. So here we have a comparison of the three platforms for uh, density map segmentation. This is basically taking a cryo-electron microscope density map and doing some analysis so that we can identify connected subregions of the density. This allows the scientist to more easily uh, label and operate on different parts of the atomic uh, structure and to do things like align uh, atomic structures to these uh, microscopy density maps. So we put this on a G single GPU. Again, here we're comparing uh, V100 GPUs again. Uh, the, the Power9 is an X SXM module, so that's a little higher clock rate, but the uh, CPU, uh, sorry, the Intel and the ARM versions are both PCI Express. Here we see the differences in performance. I would call these, although there's a spread of about 20% here, I'd say they're roughly the same. There are some differences in Power9 has a little bit lo longer CUDA uh, kernel launch lat latency and neither Power9 nor the Thunder X2 are getting the benefit from the hand-coded vectorization that's been done on the host uh, that x86 enjoys. And so I'm expecting that after I do the same work on ARM, we'll be able to close the gap there. So that's very exciting. Uh, so here's a cross-correlation calculation. This is taking uh, these cryo-electron density maps and uh, measuring their quality of fit with an atomic structure. This is a complicated, uh, you know, uh, statistical analysis that's volumetric in nature, and it has uh, a lot of memory references as well as flops. And it's, uh, there's a lot of data transfers between the host and the device. So here again, we have the three test platforms and we see uh, roughly comparable results. Again, Power9 benefits from having an NVLink connectivity to the host a little bit, but it loses a little performance due to kernel launch latencies. In the case of the ARM platform, uh, we don't have the high clock rate GPU here, and we don't have the CPU vectorized uh, pre-processing yet. But this is a pretty good result, uh, and I'm, I'm satisfied with that. And here we have a calculation of molecular orbitals. So this is used for visualization and analysis of quantum chemistry calculations. Um, we've got a multi GPU algorithm here and basically it's calculating a three dimensional uh, molecular orbital, so orbital uh, amplitude or electron density in a, in a 3D grid uh, from various Gaussian uh, uh, orbital basis sets. Uh, and we can compute this in a bunch of slices. So the decomposition is uh, sort of a round robin dynamic decomposition over GPUs uh, with different GPUs computing slices of this 3D grid and then sending them back to the host. And because there's a non-trivial amount of data transfer, 
you'll see that NVLink gives a performance boost that's noteworthy on uh, Power 9. But here we, again, if we look at uh, how ARM turns out against x86, they're very comparable. They're roughly uh, similar runtime. Again, uh, x86 is getting a little benefit from CPU vectorization of some of the setup routines, but the overall performance is roughly the same, especially with uh, two GPUs, we're only uh, you know, a hundredth of a second apart on the runtime. So that's very good. Uh, some of the most recent work that I've done, uh, Oak Ridge just installed new uh, uh, Fujitsu uh, FX A, uh, A64 FX uh, compute nodes that have SVE vectorization and hardware. And so this has created an opportunity to make uh, VMD capable of doing uh, runtime CPU dispatch. And this is, allows us to launch uh, processor specific kernels that exploit uh, different enhanced instruction sets. So for example, in the case of ARM, we've got both NEON or SVE, which can be optionally available. So on the two types of nodes that Oak Ridge has in the Wombat cluster, this means VMD can detect which types of uh, instruction sets are available. And the same uh, shrink wrapped binary can run on either processor with uh, peak performance. So this is great. And of course, we have uh, runtime detection of GPUs. So really, this means that with a single ARM64 binary, a user would be able to run on any of these different combinations of hardware, uh, and they would get the best performance that's available on the machine they're using. So um, some of the first things that need to be vectorized to bring ARM performance up to where the x86 kernels are, uh, even though that even with CUDA, is to bring uh, vectorization to some of the analytical kernels that are used heavily in the setup of these GPU accelerated calculations. So most of these are memory bandwidth bound kernels, but they do benefit from vectorization. So just as an example, I did a few of the simple analytical kernels and uh, we get roughly a factor of 3.8 uh, performance increase going from straight C++ to uh, handwritten SVE. One of the things, you know, this was really my first exposure to SVE. And so going into it, I had sort of expected an experience that was similar to what I went through when I ported the, these kernels to AVX2 or AVX512 or other vector instruction sets that I've written uh, kernels for. But I found that in fact, uh, I was very surprised SVE was a lot easier for me to use. Uh, the variable length vector uh, approach that it uses is made uh, very simple through the use, uh, it's pervasive use of predication on all the operations. So this means you have a little uh, predicate flag set that goes along with every one of the uh, operations that you're doing. And by using those, you no longer have to deal with handwriting uh, loops that process heads and tails of uh, non-vector sized or non-vector aligned operands, things like this. And this makes it a lot easier to write those kernels. And I'll show you an example in a couple of slides. Um, I'm still doing a lot of development and benchmarking here. And in, in particular, I'm going to get into some of the meteor kernels, but I'm expecting them to be uh, a lot cleaner and simpler to write than uh, some of the ones I did on other uh, architectures. One of the things that I thought was interesting, I did a little literature search about variable length vectorization. And one of the conclusions in an interesting paper I saw was that you know, you're, you're going to pay something for carrying around these predication vectors that allow the hardware to keep track of which SIMD lanes are active or uh, inhibited. Um, but that cost is very low. And so, you, you know, you might give up something versus a fixed size, uh, perfectly structured vector approach. But at most, this is in their measurements, maybe 10% cost. And I think, you know, depending on the code you're dealing with, uh, for a, a meaty loop, it, the cost can be a lot lower than that. So I'm curious to see how that works out in practice when I get to much larger kernels, but I'll show you uh, kind of what that looks like in the next slide here. So on the left, uh, I've taken a very simple piece of code that's used in VMD to pre-process uh, some uh, density maps when they're first loaded into the program. This is, uh, it's not particularly relevant to any of the benchmarks I showed, but this is a very simple uh, loop. So I chose it uh, as an example. Uh, so on the left, we have the x86 AVX implementation, and I've chopped out various uh, complicated things here just so it's sort of minimalistic. 
Um, and one of the things you'll notice is that this implementation has to have a, a section where we have uh, a loop that rolls up to an address line boundary. Uh, and this is important so that we're, we're going to ensure that we have the vector uh, achieving memory alignment. That's something we have to do on x86, whoops. And um, that's, uh, that adds some complexity, whoops. And we have, uh, then we have a loop that processes all the elements. And so this is where the meat of the work occurs. Then we have a remainder loop, which is similar to this that processes any straggling tail. And then after that, we have to do a sum reduction of the vector uh, sums uh, in the final results. Or in the case of a min or max, we have to do a, a sorry, a vector min and max. Um, and on the right, we have the SVE version. And we're basically doing the same thing. But here we have a predicate uh, variable. So this is PG. And it begins uh, with all the predicates set to true. We initialize min and max, just like we do over here. <coughs> but then uh, once the loop begins, we don't have to worry about uh, dealing with the head or the tail issues because that's addressed by the predicate test. So we have a, an SV while less than, and this basically compares the current SIMD lane to see if it's uh, less than or equal to the number that we're processing. And it will set the predication bits appropriately for the SIMD lanes that are active. And then we use that in all of our subsequent vector instructions. So we load those elements from memory, then we compute the new minimum value among the new lo newly loaded vector, the new maximum value and so on. And then we continue this loop. And because we get this predication handling all the, uh, the rough edges, there's no cleanup loop and there's no pre-roll uh, pre up loop uh, before or after. And you can see the entire kernel uh, is now on this simple page of, of text. So very easy to understand. Uh, and with that, I'll say thank you and acknowledge my colleagues at University of Illinois and thank Oak Ridge National Laboratory for their assistance in letting us port our code.